Well, good afternoon. I now have the pleasure of introducing our luncheon keynote speaker. Vice Admiral Jen Tai serves as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare and as the 66th Director of Naval Intelligence. She's also the Information Warfare Community Leader. Previously, she served as the Commander of U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and commander of the U.S. 10th Fleet, where she was the first woman to serve in command of a numbered Navy fleet. A career cryptologist, she's a graduate of the Naval Academy and has both a doctorate and a master's degree from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Let's give a very warm welcome to Vice Admiral Jan Tai. Thank you, Pete. Good afternoon. Everybody awake after that light lunch? Uh, I want to start by thanking AFSIA and the U.S. Naval Institute for putting on such a fabulous venue and such a fabulous opportunity for us in the sea services to get together with our industry partners and think about and talk about what could be and share ideas. I think this is a, a critically important venue for us. I think it's especially important for uh, the information warfare and some of those advanced type t capabilities that we want to be able to pursue and having this venue here at, you know, in San Diego, I really appreciate. You all probably don't realize that um, Vice Admiral Daly and I are something like neighbors. We behave more like siblings, but um, see, Vice Admiral Daly's place of work is on Hospital Point at the United States Naval Academy. My place of residence is on Hospital Point at the United States Naval Academy. We never ever see each other because when he's on the Hospital Point, I'm in the Pentagon. When I'm in the Pentagon, he's at Hospital Point. So we claim to be neighbors, but that, that we, 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 we still haven't seen each other. But I think it's important to think about perspective when you look at sort of that swath of land from, from metropolitan DC, big city, to um, Annapolis, Naptown, resort city, unless you're a midshipman, then maybe not so much. Um, and then go all the way over just across the Chesapeake Bay is the Eastern Shore. And life is simpler there. Big city, resort, and in that about 50 mile swath, you have a lot of different perspectives. And uh, on the way to the airport on Monday morning, I was reminded of that difference. Uh, we listened to uh, a radio station from the Eastern Shore. And it was like 6 a.m., top of the hour, stay tuned for the news. And I'm thinking, ah, what will be the headline? Will it be, you know, the underdogs win the Super Bowl? Or might it be about the stock market Friday, you know, and the precipitous decline that it suffered? Uh, perhaps even the memo. Um, but when the lady came on to talk about the headline, it went something like this. Today, a man from Easton is recovering nicely after shooting a goose over the weekend, having it hit him on the head and knock him unconscious. <laughs> so that was the, the highest news, you know, fit to report. So in, in a way, an underdog did get reported on, but it wasn't about the eagles. It was about the goose. So uh, I think it's important to, to take into account perspectives, and that's what I would like to do today is provide you my perspective on the strategic approach that the department is taking filtered down to how the Navy is looking at that strategy and working it all the way down to the information warfare uh, domain and capabilities and how we at N2 and 6 on the Navy staff are, are pursuing those. Did everybody, did anybody get to see the DepSecDef talk about the strategy yesterday? Yeah, so some of you. So the good news is, I don't think I'll be duplicative, hopefully complimentary, if I, if I do this right. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, national defense strategy. 
the strategy of the department framed under the national security strategy. And it is a recognition of return to great power competition. Uh, if you hear Secretary Mattis talk about it, he has described it as you know, being uh, a guiding, the guiding principles for how we will behave in the department, what we will pursue, the choices that we will make. Um, he acknowledges that you know, he had to make tough choices in this strategy, and, and I think that's true. And I think what you will see over the course of the next weeks, months, years, is those tough choices will play out you know, both in how we build budgets and in how we operate the force. And, and he's you know, been very clear uh, that this is, his, this is his strategy to his subordinates. I thought it was very interesting that if you've seen the unclassified document, 11 pages, easy to read. How many people have seen it? OK. It's really, it's really an easy read and really fascinating. About a third of the document is focused on the strategic environment that we find ourselves in. And I think that's really important. And, I've outlined um, those here, but you know, I don't know how many people use Waze, but if you've ever tried to get directions to a destination and you don't know where you are, you don't have you know, the network, you don't have GPS or, or Wi-Fi, it's very difficult to get ways to tell you where to go. So for the department, understanding where we stand in this global, you know, increasingly complex security environment is a really important framing, you know, to framing the conversation of where we shall go and why we will make the decisions that we're going to make. Um, that long-term strategic competition with a focus on, you know, the strategic competition uh, of Russia and China uh, will shape the decisions that we make uh, moving forward. And it really is, when you think about that competition, um, we're not playing on exactly the same playing field. You have the authoritarian uh, you know, rule. Um, Admiral Swift talked yesterday at lunch a little bit about the rule of law, um, which we are more inclined to, and the um, free and open society. So in that strategic competition, we're not necessarily playing by the same rules. So it's something that we have to take into consideration all the time. Um, we are clearly going to be contested in all domains from the seafloor to space and cyberspace, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And understanding that and preparing for it is, is critical. And I think that's a, that's a great uh, tribute to have those kinds of discussions in here. The, the, the technological advances that we find uh, happening aren't just advances that we can take advantage of. The, the cost of entry is low for our adversaries, so as a result, you have a sort of the changing nature of, of warfare. And we're going to have to be dealing with, um, you know, technology that's available to people who normally wouldn't be able to compete strategically with us. And then last, lastly, the acknowledgement that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. The, uh, you know, whether you think about American being targeted, America being targeted based on terrorist um, actions at, and you know to terrorize our citizens, or you think about um, the cyber threats coming against either individuals or against our commercial industries or against our critical infrastructure, homeland is no longer is no longer a, a sanctuary. And then just our digital footprint makes us vulnerable, the way that we behave, the way we in free and open society uh, live our lives. You know, those are vulnerabilities that we've got to contend with uh, and think about as we frame our strategic approach. And the strategic approach, you know, the three big pillars in the strategic approach in the NDS is um, along the bottom, building a more lethal force, you know, is sort of that first pillar, and there's about five things underneath it. One of those is um, modernization of key, of key areas. Um, many of those are information warfare related. Uh, example, there is a focus on the nuclear forces, our strategic deterrent. And in order to be able to command and con control our nuclear forces, we've got to be uh, making sure that we're modernizing our nuclear command and control capabilities. Strategic deterrent, 
zero fail mission, number one listed on the key technologies we've got to be able to modernize. Acknowledging uh, space and cyber as a warfare domain and, and, and making key investments there, another area that we've got to be ready to continue to um, evolve our capabilities in. Uh, C4ISR is another element that they call out in the strategy as a key element to, moder to modernization. And you heard um, Detective talk a little bit about the importance of, of the cyber resiliency inside of our networks and inside of um, our industry partner networks and the, and the need to be able to protect that kind of information. So more lethal force, strengthen our alliances and attract a, new partners and then the third is reforming the department for affordability and performance. And so there, we're going to be a lot of, lot of focus on speed in, in you know, uh, being able to change the way we do business at the speed of relevance is, is how they talk about it. So back to the more lethal force, you know, one of the um, ways that CNO has translated that in to down to the Navy is through the Navy the Nation needs, what we call the Navy the Nation needs. And that is thinking about the lethality in terms of naval power. Uh, how many people saw his heritage, um, his heritage uh, discussion, online discussion last week? Okay. So um, the way he talked about naval power was in sort of six dimensions, six. When he got to the six, he said, oh, this is, this is starting to get really complex. The only thing I could have done worse is put it on a slide. Slide? Oh, yes, she did. Um, so the fact that you didn't see it makes it you know, good for me to talk about. When we talk about naval power, very easy to default to a single threaded conversation of how you know, the size of the fleet, and that is important. We have had multiple studies over the last 18 months and multiple discussions with leadership about the demand signals on the Navy and how large, you know, what is the right sizing of the fleet. And so clearly, you know, there is, there is consensus across uh, our leadership that we're going to have to have a bigger fleet to be able to address that strategic environment that we just talked about. That is platforms. That is weapons. And for information warfare, that's an opportunity for more sensors. So that's good. Um, and when, when we talk about you know, just the size of the fleet, you know, CNO worries about you know, people thinking, well, we just start pumping out copies of what we have today. And clearly, again, to that strategic environment, that will not be sufficient to the need. We've got to be able to modernize uh, with high energy weapons, with um, high, I'm sorry, directed energy weapons, high, high powered lasers, uh, electronic warfare capabilities, and again, on the, on the information warfare side, one of the most important things we've got to be able to do is modernize our networks in a way that we can begin to take, you know, increasing advantage of the technologies that are coming in, getting to a, a, a modernized network architecture across the fleet. And then, so, so that's the bigger fleet, better fleet. That's by individual units. And then we talk about networking. We're not talking simply about the links and the communications. It's really about creating a fleet that is composable to the task or the mission that you may be going to get. We need to be able to have sensors and platforms and weapons that can talk to each other and understand the data environment and be able to leverage all of that information that we may be collecting out there to make us more lethal, to make us make our commanders at all levels, tactical, strategic, tactical, operational, strategic, um, be able to make decisions faster than the adversary. When we say networked fleet, we really mean that, not just the connections, but all of the technologies taking advantage of artificial intelligence, human machine teaming, to grow our lethality and to grow the speed at which we can make decisions. And then he talked about the fact that now that we've got more ships and we've got modern capabilities and we've networked them and we've brought AI in, well, we've got to make sure that we're tooling our sailors 
to, to be able to take advantage of all of that. The individual training, the way we recruit and retain those individual sailors, we need the talented fleet out there. The, the agile fleet part of this really gets after the fact that we have a, you know, we at OpNav spend a lot of time thinking about what are the right requirements. We are now working with industry on making sure that we're informing those requirements with really good sage advice from industry on how we should do that. Um, we, you know, hand over our requirements to the acquisition community, who again are iterating with industry on, on, on building. We recruit sailors and we train sailors to the technologies and then we toss it over to the fleet. And the acknowledgement that we've got to be able to integrate these various new advanced capabilities coming in with new operational concepts is incredibly important to being able to take advantage of what we're, the, you know, the fleet we're trying to buy and provide to fleet commanders. And so you know, a big part of that has been the warfighting development centers in, in coming up with tactical uh, um, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and coming up with concepts of operation in blending together across the warfighting domains those concepts in a way that we have, you know, a real known and ability to practice ways of operating. The most recent warfighting development center uh, that just stood up as IOC is the Information Warfare Development Center. And uh, we are very pre pleased and proud to have them working alongside all the other warfare areas to make information warfare integrated in all of those evolving concepts. And then lastly, the readiness. Um, as we're looking forward, as we're planning for that future fleet, we've got to make sure the fleet is ready today to go address the concerns of the nation and to, to fight and win today. That is training, that is maintenance, that is logistics. Um, and so clearly, you know, the discussions and some of the discussions we had yesterday was about choices. And, and what CNO says is, you know, it's a false choice to, to choose between modernizing and readiness. It's a false choice. I have to be able to do both. So I'm proud to say that, you know, for about the last 19 months, I've served on the Navy's corporate board. And we have literally you know, raised issues up as we built the Palm, and that would be Palm 19, which we begin to roll out next week. Um, raise them up so that CNO and the secretary can make decisions about how you balance across capability and capacity and the readiness piece. And so we, you can tee those up and look at where we are at any moment in time and allow for decisions to be made at the highest level across those three, you know, across those three things. Embedded in those three really are all six. And, and it's not a good conversation if you're just, you know, devolving down into how many platforms are we going to have. And that's why we, the Navy, the nation needs, you know, has been presented in this kind of a way to recognize it's more than just the ships, and the ships are critically important. It is the modernized capabilities. It is the networked uh, piece of that. And it is the new concepts coming in. So how does that apply to information warfare? Next slide. Nice pictures, huh? Everybody still awake? OK. OK. Um, the way I think about uh, information warfare and my responsibilities at OpNav N2 and 6, uh, one part of my responsibilities really are, inter are about writing the requirements, being a resource sponsor to the PBBE process for very specific programs that fit into three categories. The first is assured command and control communications. So do we have the ability, the, the, uh, the tools available, the communications available for the fleet to be able to communicate and conduct command and control in a denied environment? How do we assure that command and control? How do we make 
command and control options that are resilient and can survive in a contested environment. So we spend a lot of time working with the fleet and with the TICOM and across our staff in looking for those options and building the programs and, and sustaining programs that are gonna get us down the road for assured command and control. The second piece is battle space awareness. And again, that starts with understanding how the adversary may be arrayed from ISR, from an ISR type of scenario to understanding how our blue forces are arrayed, tools that help commanders understand both of those together, uh, positioning, navigation, and timing capabilities in a contested environment, and you know, just overall general awareness and the tools that, that, that we are pursuing to be able to bring multiple types of data together to allow decision making to go much, much faster. That's the battle space awareness portfolio. Multiple uh, programs inside of those individual programs. And then the third is what we call integrated fires. So from an information warfare perspective, um, electronic warfare capabilities, cyber warfare capabilities, and then all of the links that, come, that bring those types of uh, capabilities together so that you create kill chains both kinetically and non-kinetically and can do it at speed you know, with, the, with the area of uncertainty that you need and the speed uh, that you might need targeting to be provided in. And so that's sort of the integrated fires portfolio. And in those three dimensions, you know, we kind of think about both building a bigger fleet and building a better fleet that's what, that's what those, that, that responsibility is about. Beyond the portfolio management, we've, we have the Digital Warfare Office that, has, that stood up last year. And that's about getting after that networked fleet. How do we use, um, how do we create the standards uh, for both data and interoperability in a way that we're gonna be more lethal, that we're gonna have better speed of decision making and, and make it so that individual programs across the Navy, not just in two and six, but across the Navy, can adopt those standards and, and really create a future force that is fully interoperable and ready to go. Um, and that's not just about decision making, you know, and, and decision tools and battle management tools. That's, that also applies to our business systems and, our, and the way we do business. How do you apply data science to everything that we do to become more affordable, to become more effective in, in what we do. So Digital Warfare Office, uh, you know, when we think about building individual programs, it's a much different, it's a much different construct if you thought about building system of systems to, to, to be able to go create multiple different types of outcome in multiple mission areas. And to add to that the data science, the data environment, and the artificial intelligence, human machine teaming, deep machine learning that can enable us to act faster than, than the adversary. So that's where our digital warfare office is focused. And that's working across all the systems commands. That's working with all the type commanders to find mission outcomes that we can then apply data science to and, 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 and create better outcomes, faster outcomes, better informed decisions in both war fighting and in, uh, in our business systems. And then the next, the next part of my responsibilities is again a, a cross Navy responsibility and that's about the cyber resiliency. And creating cyber resiliency in both our IT systems and in the operational technologies that the Navy um, that the Navy uh, uses for warfighting is a critically important uh, piece of the puzzle for us. Um, we are working, again, across all the systems commands and even the shore, shore infrastructure and on the IT side to adopt the NIST standards for how to defend uh, against cyber attack. The, the framework is identify what's most important to attack, to protect, uh, protect that thing, harden it, um, and then create capabilities that can detect anomalous cyber activity inside of your 
network or operational technologies, uh, react to that and restore. When we talk about resiliency, uh, you will find that in the NDS multiple, multiple times. I find it to be a very naval, maritime uh, type idea um, because when I think of it, I think of it like a uh, ship taking a, taking a hit, being prepared to do damage control, being able to isolate you know, fire and flooding in, in various compartments and continue to fight and continue to fight the ship. The same is true in cyber. We've got to create our networks, and that's, that's what we are proceeding to do, create our networks and our operational technologies in a way that if something goes wrong, something goes bad, we can isolate that and continue to depend on other parts of the network. Not an easy thing, but that's what, that's what we are endeavoring to do. And so being able to detect anomalous activity and, and react at machine speed is, is also um, capabilities that we have to be able to put not only in our IT systems, but in our OT systems. And we are pursuing that across the Navy. We are pursuing multiple investments across the Navy. And N2N6 and leads that, that investment discussion um, for all the resource sponsors. I would say the last piece that if I didn't mention it, it, it wouldn't be obvious to you is um, sort of the strategic intelligence piece of it. Uh, Navy has to make decisions on programs going forward and understanding you know, what's happening in the adversary space. What is it that we should be building to be able to counter, to be able to really compete um, is something that you know, we're working on at the OPNAV level to inform programs, to inform uh, investment decisions. And so strategic intelligence is a critical piece of what we bring to the, to the Navy staff um, to make the best decisions possible. So I feel like I've talked enough. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> My brother has a question. Jan, Admiral Tai, question for you on, you said there's a program in place to have people from industry comment on requirements so you can understand standards and the trades earlier. And then you also talked about the fact that we throw those requirements over the transom to the acquisition community, and there also has to be a similar dialogue there. Because of the audience that we have with so many industry partners, could you just give a little bit more detail on how they can see into that process or get into the process on providing um, industry comment sure. on developing requirements. Sure, thanks, thanks for that. that. It's really a cultural change. It's a cultural change that it, it kind of goes back to what DepSecDef said yesterday. It's, it's an acknowledgement that you know, we inside the government aren't going to have all the answers. There, I said it. We aren't going to have all the answers. And so, you know, sequestering a team in a room, you know, for 18 months to come up with what is the right set of requirements that we should go be pursuing without having discussions with industry in a way that um, can help inform, you know, that's a really dumb idea. It's going to cost you this much money and take you this long. And, you know, you could have something a little bit less for so much better. So uh, we've, we on the information warfare side have been using, um, all right, Boris, are you out there? Right. Um, it's been sort of like an RFI process. Um, what, what am I, what, what am I, what's the word I'm trying to use? You're asking me an acquisition question. I am an acquisition professional, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's just an, it, we've just been, we just have to iterate, and I think we recognize that. Um, one of the things we've done recently, uh, as another example, and this gets back to DepSecDef talking about we shouldn't be making standards, you should be making standards, but when you're talking about data and interoperability, we have to make some choices. They need to be informed choices, but we have to make some choices, otherwise everything will have, you know, individual data links that are, that are talking to each other. So one of the things we've done recently is um, develop a draft policy about how we will do uh, command and control and defense in a commercially provided cloud. 
So we drafted that up. We shared it with our service partners. We uh, have been sequentially taking it to cloud service providers to go, does this make sense? Can you do this? Can we do this? Is there another way or a better, different way to say that? And so it's, it's, being, it, you know, it's, it's, it's happening on a program by program basis, but I think it comes in the form of RFIs where we've got kind of the beginnings of an idea, what we think we're gonna go build or, or what we think you know, is, gonna, is gonna meet the, the realm of the possible. And then you put it out there for comment, take those comments in before you really go forward with an RFP. That's how we're doing it. I, I don't know how many of you may have felt that uh, so far, but, but we've, been, we've been working on that to try to make our RFPs better, more informed. Sydney. Hi, Admiral. Hi. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Let me ask, you know, the NDS Minch goes into great depth about return to great power competition. Uh, there's a lot of effort across all the to refocus from coin to great power competition. In the cyber and electronic spectrum worlds, we're kind of already there because the advancements in threat is often a nation state th great power threat. Right. Uh, we have you know, the Russians claiming that they shut down the Donald Cook's Aegis system with EW, which is interesting, uh, if not true. But you know, we're actually seeing those threats day to day. So how does that you know, challenge you day to day? How does that perhaps help you get ready for day to day, and conversely, to what extent are you so busy with the day to day that you don't have time to reorient towards the really high end scenarios where you know people unleash the exploits, the jammers they may have been holding back mm -hmm. uh, in this kind of gray zone we're in now? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you for the question. I, I think you're right, particularly on the cyber side, insofar as you know our cyber our, our cyber warriors have been focused, very focused on the high end threats, uh, training to it the advanced uh, persistent threat. And so to the degree we can uh, monitor and or see and or learn how those high-end threats are behaving in the network, we're training to that and dealing with it, um, if not inside of our networks, at least from a perspective of being able to follow the you know, really quite robust cy uh, com you know, cybersecurity industry that has been very good about you know dissecting and publishing those things. So I think we're, I think you're right on the cyber side. We're dealing with that every day, and we're able to train to it. Um, on the electromagnetic maneuver warfare side of the house, I would say that we have glimpses of being in a contested environment, but it's not nearly uh, to the degree that we need to have it ubiquitously understood and being in that fight every day. So uh, using uh, training scenarios, using live virtual constructive uh, ways of training our folks to deal with and fight through in the electromagnetic maneuver warfare side of the house, you know, is how we're gonna proceed with that. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, Admiral. Captain Sean Kanab. I'm the uh, Marine Communications Detachment OIC over at Expeditionary Strike Group 3. Uh, one of the major problems that I've run into is uh, C2 interoperability between the Marine Corps and the Navy, specifically when it comes to collaboration services. Uh, one, are there any discussions at the top of the Navy and the Marine Corps about maximizing the efficiency and the effectiveness uh, of those C2 systems, specifically in, uh, in regard to like the networks so of Mixen talking to uh, the Navy side and vice versa, and then even getting rid of the Marine Corps enclaves on the amphib ships. Uh, and if there are discussions, what are some of the solutions that uh, they're trying to produce? Ura. All right. <laughs> um, thanks for that question. I'm gonna start at the high level and probably not dive too deep into your question. I get to do that because I'm a three star. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the Marine Corps has recently established a, a counterpart for me. We go to the Naval Boards, right, Whaler? And I have someone to sit with now. Uh, that's Lieutenant General Dan O'Donohue, who has a 2-6 uh, type portfolio. And we have been, uh, you know, sort of inseparable. Every Assured Command and Control Summit that we've had, every Information Warfare Flag Officer 
uh, training symposium that we had, every discussion that's about the high-end fight and what we, the Navy, are doing with it, we've been inviting him, and he's been showing up. And so uh, he is uh, interested in exactly what you talked about. How do we start, first and foremost, with an operational concept, you know, an operational problem that we think we're going to find ourselves in, and back that up into what's the operational architecture, what's the network architecture that we need collectively, the naval architecture, that will allow us to fight the fight together in a, in a combined way across the naval force. So we are in the early days of that, but at the highest level, we're, we're working on that and looking for um, ways that uh, the Marine Corps can leverage work that we've already done in the Assured Command and Control. Um, I don't think we're to a place yet that says, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna ride on on canes, you know, beginning tomorrow. Everything's gonna ride there, but that is certainly within the realm of the possible. Moving down the road, having a common architecture, and you wouldn't necessarily need a separate enclave for that. So, I think that's definitely possible, and those discussions have begun, and we're we're working those pretty closely. Uh, Following up with the Marine theme, uh, Scott Kinner with the Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. Uh, one of the things that uh, the CNO touched, a talented fleet, and it's been nibbled at a couple of different of the uh, discussion groups here over the last day and a half, uh, is people, the people aspect. So right. two, two parts to that, my, my question to you. First, a lot of the innovation, adaption, lethal, agile, agile, those are all buzzwords unless you create an organizational culture that can live into those. So what, uh, from your perspective, does the service need to be doing services need to be doing to get after organizational cultural changes and then tied to that is the entire uh, HR talent management aspect especially when it comes to your portfolio if you could comment on those thank you I think I can um, you know the cultural changes that that we need to be able to move faster are is going to be the you know the hardest thing we we can we can uh, we're going we're going to solve um, the reform of the department and then translating down into reform inside of our own services um, is, is, is a cultural change. Uh, so, you know, uh, um, had an initiative back before he was a CNO and, and he called it reducing administrative distractions. And it was sort of like, what are all those things that are kind of administrative in nature that we should stop doing um, so that we can focus on the high-end war fight. And, uh, you know, he, he says he felt like he opened, you know, the cage for the lion to roam freely and do what lions do, um, but the lion stayed in the cage, you know. So the cultural aspect of not knowing how to get out of your own cage is something that we're going to have to work on. I think in our competition for talent, the young people that we're bringing in today have a much higher expectation of how networked we are, of how they would do, um, how, how they would expect to be able to interface with the, our HR systems, our MPT&E systems. And, um, and I, I think we recognize that as a service. And so actually leading the charge into the digital domain is our N1. Uh, manpower personnel training and education folks who are, you know, have found exactly, how do you describe it? It's almost like a, a data strategy. What must we be able to do? How should we do this? And now let's go pursue the technologies that enable that. So we're piloting um, you know, some of that work in the cloud in the near term and uh, driving, CNO is driving that pretty hard and CNP is uh, a, a big part of that. I don't think I got the second part of your question, or unless I answered both of them in one fell swoop. Let's go with that. Uh, <laughs> the other part of the question was uh, talent management. So if you're getting the best and brightest and schoolers after they've done their first tour, whether it's officer enlisted, they're still being tempted to leave. So what are we doing on the talent management side of the house to get the best and brightest ones to you instead of uh, the many other opportunities they have in the first sector? Sure. Um, Talent management, how do we keep them? I think particularly in the information warfare um, uh, areas, um, we know that we're not going to be able to um, 
meet the price point that the commercial industries could provide in terms of being able to retain. And so as an alternative approach, we thought we'd try this, see how it sounds. Um, give them the training that they need, put them on an important mission, and get the heck out of their way. That's what we're trying to do. That's our retention strategy. Um, we're also taking a look at the career paths, the individual career paths of the different ratings that participate, uh, you know, that are part of information warfare and trying to make sure that they make sense in terms of building skills and being able to apply those skills you know, to the war fight directly. Yes. Good afternoon, Admiral. Greg Brundage from CSRA. Uh, I'd like to go back to the national defense strategy as you did your uh, slide on the Navy power build. Um, some would look at the strategy as a great case for all of the services to go modernize and basically make up for a lot of the things that we've not been able to do in the past. Um, and some would say by doing that, we're ignoring some of the real world things that we find ourselves doing with our military. So we're kind of doing a trade off uh, in dealing with things like Syria, like you know the places that we fought. I'd like to get your thoughts on if in fact you feel that way, are you able to still address those types of conflicts in light of the major modernization push that a lot of the services are gonna basically go after based on the NDS? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Uh, Secretary Mattis has actually talked about this and it gets to the point of, you know, we are not doing our jobs if we aren't preparing for that high-end fight. We must get on the path to that high-end fight, and, you know, we're only going to be limited by appropriation and how quickly we potentially can get there, capacity and modernization. Um, but at the same time, we're not going to abandon our, our responsibilities today and, and the fights that we are in today, and that kind of gets after the readiness piece. I do think... You know, I do think that um, hard decisions will be made, have been made, will continue to be made on how we do force employment. What's the right, you know, what's the right force employment for the forces that we have available to go downrange as it pertains to, you know, some of the fights that we're in versus some of the fights that we need to be prepared to be in. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Hi, Vivian Mashi with National Defense Magazine. Um, I was wondering if you could provide a few examples of where industry could really help you, understanding that budgets are finite, but as you're moving from the gray zone to this high-end fight, where can industry really provide the technology you need for both defensive and offensive cyber? Thank you. Well, um, as I suggested, um, we need defensive cyber capabilities, not only for our IT, but in our operational technologies. And uh, that's an area that has not been necessarily uh, very robust in the past. Uh, we have industries growing into that oper the operational technology side, but it's, it's not a, there's not an off-the-shelf solution for being able to defend the operational technologies directly. We're hearing a lot about um, focus in those areas when we think about critical infrastructure, uh, wind turbines, dams, electrical SCADA, you know, the, the power grid, et cetera. You know, even, you know, even um, damage control, uh, first responder kind of, kind of folks. And so uh, our ability to take some of those kinds of uh, technologies and bring them in to naval platforms is something that we're very, very interested in being able to do. Um, and again, you know, part of what DepSecDef talked about is how quickly can we integrate? How quickly can we integrate? And I, you know, less of an industry problem, more of a government problem, but anything that, you know, any ideas that you have on what we could do differently uh, in terms of integrating those capabilities into our, into our networks, into our platforms, um, we'd welcome them. The other thing I would say is uh, when it comes to cyber and cyber defense, um, we really, it would be really helpful to uh, get after our authority to operate our certification and accreditation problems, uh, problems are not the right word, the way we do that, the sort of mechanical way that we did it in DIACAP, we're moving into 
the RMF uh, risk management framework, um, but it's still for us, you know, kind of a slow process. So how do we get better uh, and quicker? Continuous monitoring is one of those ways, but we've got to, we've really got to uh, get faster because the idea of being able to turn software development, software projects, not buying systems, but building software to ride on our infrastructure is something that the department is very interested in and I think we'll get really, really good at being fast, the speed, changing at the speed of relevance to increase our capabilities in a software-based way. So once we do that, uh, we, we, from a cybersecurity perspective, need a fast way of certifying those, those capabilities. We have some pilots uh, in that regard. And some of it, again, is on our side in getting after the standards upon which, you know, the security controls that you're inheriting. But that's, that's how, that's the, those are, you know, two of the things that I'm thinking about that you could help us with. One more question. Yes. There's one over here. Yep. Uh, Ma'am, John Marcy with NetMaker Communications. I had a question uh, listening to your portfolio and what have you. One of the blaring gaps I caught was a strategy on telecommunications. The telephony infrastructure is broke. We're talking about transitioning it to IP, but I don't hear any cyber strategy on how you're going to protect real-time service protocols within that cyber environment. Could you comment on that? Um, hmm. You know, I think that kind of falls into the same category of we're not just talking about networks when we talk about cyber resilience. We've got to build, uh, you know, we've got to build a perspective that, that you know, the folks working on the BCOs and, and, and again, we depend a lot on DISA for, for some of that, um, have got to have the perspective of what would a cyber attack look like coming after you know, a, a base communications office. What would it look like? What does resilience look like? How can we recover from that and, and sort of build those kinds of things in? The same is true on the power side on, on our bases where we get the fleet underway. And so, so across the cyber resilience um, work that we've been doing, we call it a cyber XCOM, um, we look across all of those dimensions. And I think the, the base communications is a subset of, of our shore-based infrastructure that we're taking a look at. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Brother? Something right here for you. Okay. Admiral Ty, thank you for that run-through on what is a very challenging portfolio. And uh, on behalf of FCA International and the U.S. Naval Institute, we have a U.S. Naval Institute book here, Great Powers, Grand Strategies, New Game in the South China Sea, with an FCA bookmark. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.